Good afternoon. Welcome to Match Day. Can you hear me, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Good, good. And uh, Ian is uh, here with us. And Jay and Lick, can you say hello for us? Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So that's an audio check. So uh, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for, for coming on. And and you and I met many years ago when I was uh, oh, a state director of coaching for Indiana Youth Soccer, and we were hosting our first ever C license. And you were flown in to teach me how to teach. And uh, it was wonderful. And uh, so I learned so much from that course. But uh, uh, it's been ever since then, we've been, you know, uh, friends and kept in touch. And and to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and, and definitely from your best team, which is the one at home. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for being on. But uh, so uh, we'll start with a little bit with your journey. So how did you get to where you are? And yeah, let's go from there. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, gosh, I got started coaching, uh, way back in the day doing soccer camps for a gentleman named John Ellis. Uh, he, um, was kind enough to, to hire me. Uh, I, I like to say it was an aquatics engineer, uh, even though I was a glorified water boy, but, uh, I got my start at camps, uh, worked alongside Jill Ellis, Paul Ellis, April Heinrichs, uh, just a plethora of amazing coaches that I could learn from. And, uh, from there, I got into uh, different uh, high school routes, um, college coaching, uh, club routes, ODP, region staff. Uh, ended up working for U.S. Soccer uh, back in 01 um, and uh, ultimately coaching the Pro League in 03 and the WSA. And uh, that folded, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, most recently moved down to Columbus, Georgia, now coaching at Columbus State University and been there 17 years. 17 wonderful years and you've had some great seasons some great success you know some wonderful success as of late right and and throughout you know so yeah it's awesome and then we have a mutual friend who is uh on this show regularly samantha snow she's a she's a queen so um but uh anyway thank you and so what we and by the way we've got 18 people watching this live right now and marco is from portugal so which is really cool uh, we got Rob from Missouri, and then other people are just chiming in on our bald heads, and someone called us triplets. But, uh, yeah. Um, Three stooges. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get to it. Um, and then, you know, obviously uh, what we might get some questions in the chat box, but you, you've you recently put out some uh, some new, like, little documents to kind of work with your team. I'm assuming this is during this period, right? During COVID and, or did you do this uh, self-identity sheet prior to COVID? Yeah, we actually started uh, after the 2017 season. Um, okay. In 2015, we went to the national championship. Unfortunately, yep. it came up a little short. Uh, 2016, had another great year, went to the final four, uh, lost in the semifinals. Um, and then 2017, we thought we had a really good club, really good college team. And uh, we got absolutely crushed in the Sweet 16. And so between several of us, we came together and, and put together this team analysis form. And, and it really took off because not only did we fill it out as a staff, uh, we gave it to our leadership council, which is comprised of eight members of our team, uh, two freshmen, two sophomores, two juniors, two seniors. And we filled it out kind of by ourselves. However, when we compiled all the results, it was, it was crazy to see how everything correlated into the one item we struggled with the most in 2017 was something called recoverability. And uh, we, we wouldn't probably have known that unless we had developed this team analysis form. And we said, well, now we have to put that on the field. And we have to be able to train that in sessions to get us better for the 2018 fall. Very good. So let's uh, let's start there. By the way, Jay, just so everyone knows, um, you know, he's at Columbus State, but he's um, very integral as far as uh, empowering women to be, you know, coaches and take coaching education. He has a mentoring program on Wednesdays. So can they reach out to you if they're interested in that? 100 percent yeah it's uh, it's been an awesome program we, we just started about a, a month ago vince and uh jill ellis and i kind of came up with the idea and we just presented it to 
as many female coaches that want to jump on board. Uh, we typically go every Wednesday around noon. Uh, we get a variety of speakers. It's an opportunity to network, opportunity to fellowship, uh, and, and certainly develop as a coach. Uh, those typically, the female coaches are the ones coaching females. Uh, however, uh, our subjects are extremely broad. They cover a wide variety of topics. And uh, our yeah. next one is next Wednesday, uh, June 10th at 12. And we've got the head coach of the Scotland women's national team coming on, Shelly Kerr. And after that, we've got a gentleman, Doug Lemoff, who's unbelievable with pedagogy skills. Uh, so it's, it's been pretty fun. So how can they access that? How did, where do they access that? just have to send me an email uh, to my Columbus State email address, which is entlick underscore Jason at columbusstate.edu, or they can always reach out to you, Vince, and, and go through your platform or Ian and, and get back to me, and I'll just add them. No problem. Okay, so just to write, I got entlick.jason at columbusstate.edu. Entlick underscore. Yeah, underscore, like sorry. underscore line, Jason yep. at columbusstate.edu. Yep. Okay, hey, Jay, one of our um, one of our guests is Rob from Missouri, who had the opportunity to work with you in the community service program at the 2016 Final Four in uh, San Diego. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were out there yeah. and uh, we went to, uh, I think, an elementary school. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, so Rob just wanted to make sure he said hi. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had a great time. Well, very good. So – this way, I'll share my screen, and we have one less bald-headed man on here. Um, so can you see my screen okay, Coach? Yep. Awesome. So if you want, you can take us through it and just tell me when to scroll up and down, and and then okay. we'll go to your next document as well. So. Well, for, first and foremost, um, you know, to be honest, this is a document that really could be used by anyone in the country, anyone outside the country. You can – make up your own rating system that pertains to your team. Um, now for college, uh, the ultimate goal is a national championship. Maybe for high school, it, it might be a state championship. So again, the rating system can be edited in any way, shape or form. And the idea is uh, we just came up with certain topics that we felt were, were necessary to be a championship building team. Yep. And uh, so if you scroll down a little bit, um, what we basically do is identify d different subjects. And on the left-hand side, we graded our team from the 2017 season. So based on the 2017 fall, uh, we gave ourselves, we won the league. Um, so we, we overachieved, um, meaning we won the games we were supposed to, and we stole the ones that we probably shouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, we were good defensively. You know, all of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, scores first. So we traditionally scored the first goal in a lot of our games in 2017. However, what we realized was the opportunities where we started the game being a goal down, we weren't able to recover with that group in 2017. Hmm. And, and that was our kind of our biggest takeaway. But keep scrolling down, um, scores a variety of goals, uh, gave ourselves pretty good grades there because we still – I mean, we had a good year in 2017, but we weren't great. Yeah. Um, it, you know, some of the other things that we felt like we needed to work on, we had a bunch of freshmen. Uh, so all the way down has clear leadership. We started like six freshmen in 2017. So that was another area where we felt we needed to get better, but we knew that it was going to get better as those kids kind of got more experience. Yeah. yeah. We always say that your experiences lead you to make better judgment. Um, we also knew that our team chemistry needed to get better. Um, and that was something, again, you bring in a bunch of new kids that are getting lots of playing time. Team chemistry is going to continue to grow. Yeah. We also yeah. knew that we were going to be taking a trip to England in the spring of 2018. Uh, so we knew that our leadership was going to certainly grow then. Uh, our team chemistry was going to grow by, by taking an international trip. But if you scroll all the way back up to the top, the one thing that kept coming up with our team was how do we recover when we go a goal down? And, and everybody's got different ideas. I know people play around with it. They go, okay, we're going to use the scoreboard. Yeah. And, and we're going to immediately up on the scoreboard at practice. We're going to say, you're goal down. Uh, you get 10 minutes to come back. And I'll tell you the one thing we learned with that, Vince, was um, 
to be fair, e even just saying you're a goal down, it's not real. So we even started to do at training sessions was if we were going to play some sort of a 77 game or 8v8, yeah. uh, basically <clears throat> right before kickoff, we would award a penalty kick to the red team. <laughs> so the ball would actually, they would see the ball go in the goal. Yeah. And then they'd have to get it out of the goal, bring it back, set it down at midfield, and then we'd start the activity. So instead of just saying you're a goal down, yeah. uh, they visually have to have that feeling of seeing the ball go in the goal, the goalkeeper feeling kind of helpless because she allowed the goal to happen, and yep. then starting it from there. So little nuances like that. Yeah, um, that's big time. Yeah. You know, but, but yeah. you have to visually show it. You can't just say you're a goal down. Fight Right, back. right, right. No, that's fantastic. Um, oh, uh, hey, ben, can I can I interrupt for a second, Vince? Sorry. Is yep. there any way, Vince, you can maybe reduce the percentage size of your screen, the one twenty six? Oh. And um, so, a little bit more. Rob was asking, do you see a bit more? If that's the most we can get, and it all will be available afterwards as a download because I believe Jay is sharing this with us. So yep. you can't see it all during the presentation. Or it's not uh, quite right for you. Don't stress because we'll we'll make sure Jay uh, is willing to share with you. Yep. yep. And, and, and again, like I said earlier, Vince and Ian, the, the the document is something that certainly can be changed. That maybe you feel some of these topics don't pertain to you. You can, you can always change them, edit it. And uh, we just kind of came up with a a couple coaches got together and said, hey, these are the things that are going to make us successful. Yeah. Um. No, it's. I think it's brilliant. So I'm just popping up your uh, session, so it's ready to okay. go. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's ready to go, and then uh, uh oh, there we go. So oh, you had it. Yep. Okay. Oh, Do you want to go to the session? Well, we can talk a little bit about the session, and then maybe yeah. answer some questions. But kind of some of the key ingredients that we thought about, and 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 really the sessions. Uh, you know, there, there's gimmicks in a lot of sessions and this, that, and the other, but th this first session, this was actually our very first session in preseason on August 13th in 2018. Mm -hmm. Uh, so basically it was just a little, uh, it's a little six V four game where two attacking players have to drop off the field and then they have to get themselves on sides. Uh, oh. we have our goalkeepers training with our goalkeeper coach, but I think, the important thing, Vince, is um, the objective. So it's not yeah. necessarily the 6v4 game. But what, what we made sure of was each round lasted six minutes. So if you look, there's two, two games going on kind of side by side. And so there's four individual teams. So each team was competing for points themselves. And what we said was the first to two wins. So again, if you look on the right side of the, the page of, and, and it's a, a red versus a green and the red team goes up a goal one nil. Well, right yeah. now we've created uh, what's called an at bat for the green team to try and recover. Okay. So yeah. that's the key ingredient, giving your teams in training opportunities to grow from their weakness. So the weakness is you're down a goal. Yeah, fight back because if red scores again, they get the point for that little window. However, oh. that's just one point. Yeah. Then the coach says, "Okay, new game. We still got <laughs> six minutes. So you, now, right away, green is down a point. Yeah. But now they've got to play, continue the the phase, and go again." And so what it is, is it's, again, creating the, the, from Doug Lemoff the at-bats of you need repetition of constantly being put in situations where you're having to recover. Yeah. And this was just one way to do it. Um, and, and there's several other ways that, that we've developed. And uh, it was massive for our program because it, it showed about four games in. We go down to a, a place called Flagler, a very, very good program. And we go down one nil, seven minutes in the game. Yeah. My assistant coach, Nick Zimmerman, you know, God bless him. Wonderful. But one of the best assistants I've ever worked with. He's absolutely going bon you know, bonkers. He's like, this sucks. <laughs> We're, uh, what's going to happen? Like, Don't worry. We've been training. So then we yeah. go down two nil. He's going nuts. He's like, we're going to give him a bollocking. No. 
We go down 2-1, so we've climbed back a little bit. As soon as yep. we score to make it 2-1, Flagler goes up 3-1. So then we get to halftime, and Coach Nick, is he, he wants to have an absolute go at the kids. And, and I said, listen, this, there's no reason. We, we've trained this for an entire month in preseason. We're fine, guys. We're going to change the shape. And again, that goes further down on yep. how do you teach recoverability? Sometimes you're going to have to play at a different shapes. Um, sometimes yep. you're going to have to move personnel. So we, we've, we've developed that through our system. And again, as, as you're scrolling down to the 77 game, yep. one thing we, 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 we talk a lot about autonomy and self-determination theory. So we yep. would put the onus on the players yep. to allow them the opportunity to change the shape depending on the game yeah right? depending on where you are in the game and again um, playing for points and so our biggest thing in, in that 2018 preseason was just saying listen regardless of where we're at in the game how much time's left we've always got a chance to win and if you look back on our 2018 fall we came back probably four or five times from being a goal down to win games Mm. Uh, it wasn't until 2018's Elite Eight, uh, we went down 1-0 in the 52nd minute, and we unfortunately didn't recover that time. However, it wasn't from a lack of heart right. or uh, training. Uh, it was simply uh, the goalkeeper stood on their head. Uh, we missed a pen. We had 17 corners. We hit crossbars. We just came up short that day. Yeah. However. Anyone that looks at the game going, this is a team that was had no issues when it came to recoverability. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Coach Barker, are you any questions um, on the chat box or anything? This is wonderful, Jay. This is, I mean, every, just from the everything from the beginning, right, to how you, how you actually figured out that, you know, well, this is one thing we got to get better at, you know, again, from the team. You know, because you know, as well as, I, you know, players buy in what they help create, right? And if they help create it, they buy in a whole lot better. Um, and that's what you did. You created that culture. So, you know, they're creating it and hopefully they're buying in. Um, so this has been outstanding. But uh, and thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to leave it up to uh, to Mr. Barker to kind of ask him. Well, you. <laughs> Eugene had a good question. So um, Sue Ryan has always been a proponent of the situational games. Hmm. So Sue starts games 1-0, you're 1-0 up, and the other team's got 10 minutes. So the question from Eugene was, do you always start on a basically on a 0-0 premise and then play the micro game, or sometimes do you create an additional imbalance in the scoreline? Uh, we, we, we've tried so many different things. Uh, you know, just the, the key ingredient for, for me that I've learned through the coaching world is not just putting up on a scoreboard, but having, having a team see the ball go in the goal. Um, so again, um, starting a contest, well, sometimes we'll start zero, zero for sure, but there's gotta be moments where you're teaching recoverability and they see the ball go in the goal or, um, Typically, in certain teams, you have one player that seems to be the winner, right? Yeah. You know, whatever team this kid is on, she or he have that knack of their team's going to win. So we also did some opportunities where um, you can make a trade after a goal is scored. Sweet. So, yeah. for example, uh, but it, it could only be a trade, positional player for positional player, meaning – um, I can't trade one of my defenders for your top forward. Right. So I'm going to trade for your forward. You get to pick one of my forwards. And what that did was we had a kid, Riley Clark, who every time she's on that team, she wins. So she would score for the blue team. And then she would immediately have to go over to the opponent's team. <laughs> and again, she was on the losing end. She was down one nil. So she had to work on recoverability, being down a goal, playing for the opposite team, whereas this team now is up a goal. So it's situational, but um, they had to find a new leader, and then Riley had to rally the troops on the other team. So we're constantly trying to figure out different ways to change up the teams within the session. We also have uh, – we allow teams to call a timeout. Uh, so pretty much throughout the session, uh, throughout the phase – 
uh, if we're not working on periodization or fitness, we'll say, hey, I'm okay with you calling a timeout in the middle of a session. So if a team's getting pumped in practice, blue, hey, coach, timeout. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's up to you. You got to fix it. Yeah. So it doesn't Jay, always have to be the coach. Yeah. No, it's awesome. Um, apologize. Didn't mean to interrupt you. So, uh, so question for you. So when the kids got traded, how did it make the kid that like the player that they traded for, how'd that make them feel? Right. Did it? Yeah. Were there it, any it, consequences of that? Well, it, it, it teaches them how to have to react because again, it's not normal. Right. right. And it, it's, right. it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And I think nowadays we're so afraid to put kids in uncomfortable situations, but being down a goal is considered uncomfortable. Yeah. So, and giving them more at bats and training so that when you get to a real game and a player gets injured uh, and she's one of your better players, hey, no big deal. We've been through this before. You know, hey, think about training. Riley got traded to the opponent's team. You had to deal with it then. You're fine. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, no, it, and we always say it, it's don't take it personally. You are being yeah. traded because it's positional play. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be I'm different if you train, you, 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 you get rid of your worst player. And so it was yeah. always like, oh, I got one. Yeah, because I was always play. the one getting picked on, but me. But, right. uh, you know, I got a complex, obviously, from it. But, um, no, uh, outstanding, by the comments are flying in, by the way, just outstanding stuff, and people love this stuff. And it's, it's refreshing to talk soccer <laughs> again <laughs> yeah. to me um, and, and Ian as well. And just so you know, so, like, your timeouts, we call them tactical breaks in our coaching through games methodology that we're presenting on our new national or revised national diploma. It's like a TGFU model, kind of what you're doing, right? With uh, with the recoverability type sessions. But uh, wonderful, you know, little gamification in there, right? Trade players and that's big time. So I absolutely love it. Um, Jay, I got to pop off, but I'm going to let Coach Barker uh, end. And thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, we get to see each other soon. So no, thank you. glad to be here. Yep. So bye, Good. everybody. Let Coach Barker uh, take the rest. Yeah, so Jay, if I can just steal a couple more minutes because we've got a couple sure. of questions. Yeah. One observation I like about the trading of players and things, because we talk about this in the coaching schools, right? If it, When we were kids and we played in the park, we broke into two teams. And if the game got five or six nil, we would reconstitute the teams or change the rules or do something. And unfortunately, a lot of our youth culture is about putting all the best players on the team and smashing everybody into oblivion, which is no use to you when you get them at the collegiate level, when you're playing the likes of a flagler. So I think that type of adaptation of keeping the competitive challenge there all the time, I love that. Um, Amin had a question which relates to that sort of automatic body language when something bad happens and you drop your head. Um, if, you're, if you're having that situation in the training environment where you go a goal down and, and it's tough, how did you replicate or how did you manage the psychology of disappointment in training so that ultimately they didn't overreact to the negative in the game in the game condition? Well, you know, we, we, we had a lot of trigger words. Uh, so, for example, each one of your players uh, has certain trigger words that kind of get them back on track, just like a coach. And so, for example, um, I, I can remember vividly in 2015 in the national championship, we're down one nil, even though we're out shooting, we're out playing Grand Valley. I think it was like 10 to 10 to one. We're down one nil about two minutes before halftime. And we give up a goal right before half. It's like 11 seconds. I go into halftime and I'm so upset that we gave up the second goal that I gave nothing constructive at halftime. Absolutely crushed the kids. And we go out and we play horrible in the second half and we lose 2-0. We just, we don't really recover from it. And I'll always remember that because Coach Nick said, listen, that's not how you need to be at halftime. Like we got nothing out of that halftime talk. And so from then on, Coach Nick was my trigger guy that if I had bad body language or my verbal behavior, my nonverbal behavior, whatever, he would say, hey, Coach, laugh. Laugh. This is fun. We're fine. And so he would bring me back. And it's the same with players, Ian. 
uh, your players have to be able to deal with that on the field. So there's got to be those leaders that if someone gets kind of out of their realm, they got to be brought back in, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that's, that's the key is players on the field or a coach has to have a trigger word to bring them back. And when, when you're recruiting very often, those of us that recruit a lot in the collegiate environment, you're not looking just at the ability of the player to, to pass and run and control. You're looking for the kid that maybe pats another kid on the backside or picks up a scrimmage vest when the bench is clearing and things like that. So that type of character, he or she doesn't have to be your strongest performer technically, tactically, but they're the ones that can pull you out of those types of situations. Um, <clears throat> Rob had a question about the distinction between changes of style as opposed to changes of formation. So in your example of Flagler, um, was it a stylistic change or was it a formation change or was it just sticking to your game plan? What, what was the change that got you back? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it was uh, it, it's a little bit of everything. Um, you know, we, we showed up, we, we had beaten Flagler several times, not only during the regular season, but also during the, the conference tournament, the NCAA tournament. And so we were just a little flat in the first half. Uh, but we also found the right matchups. Uh, we also found uh, weaknesses in the opponent. Uh, we moved one of our top players that was was up front playing back to pressure to a wing midfielder in a 3-5-2. Um, you know, but also we had to get more numbers in the box because we were playing out of a 4-3-3 and uh, we just weren't having a lot of success. Um, but, you know, in the end, um, I, I truly believe – uh, players, regardless of what formation, whatever system we're playing, that they're so interchangeable. I really believe that that game came back to the the willing the the understanding that regardless of where we're at in the game, we have the ability, we have the belief that we can recover, and it's because we trained them all during the preseason on almost every session in, and I can send them to you was all on recoverability. And it was just gaining ground every single day and saying, hey, you're down. What are you going to do? And, uh, so, and it was awesome. Rob's question uh, comes from he was listening to a um, listening to Chris Ramsey, who's at QPR. Before I before I comment, Chris Ramsey actually has our premier diploma. And when he was the assistant at Spurs, the head coach was not eligible to coach in Europe. So when Spurs went into Europe, Chris Ramsey was the head coach of Spurs on record in the Champions League, and he's got an NSCA Premier Diploma. So that's nice. that's kind of good. Somewhere in, in Rob's experience with Chris, though, on this most recent thing, Chris had said, we um, change the formation, but we don't change style. And I'm not quite sure of the context, but I, I ch would challenge a little bit there. If you if you decided to play a low block counterattacking game and you're 2-0 down, you've got to come out. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think... We get too obsessed about formations and what we're really talking about is our step, style of attack or defending high tempo a little bit lower but it's going to have to adjust if the score line dictates it just has to right right and i, and I think in the end listen it's uh <laughs> you know the score the scoreboard doesn't lie so in the end it's uh style formation formation is just a, a, a starting point whatever it may be uh, you can play a three-five-two in so many different ways. You can play direct soccer. You can play indirect. You can not have your your. You can call them three center backs. You can you can have them stay home the whole time, or you can have them get forward, and, and you can have one of your six or your eight drop in. And so there's just so many nuances. Um, but but in the end, um, I, I just think ultimately at halftime, we as coaches have to be better at solving problem yeah. instead of just telling them this is what you've done wrong for 45 minutes um, we need to give them three simple things that they can do to solve how to win the game because ultimately uh, people can say what they want about soccer and it's pretty soccer or not pretty soccer um, the reason you play soccer is to outscore the opponent if you yeah. don't you either tie or you lose so we knew that day was a key day for us because Flagler's a dang good team, and we had to get the result. And unfortunately, college soccer is result-oriented, and uh, we, we had to win. Uh, so we chose to just play out of a little bit different shape 
and just get two players locking down their two center backs. And that made a huge difference. It's, it's interesting you tell the story of, of giving the halftime team talk that in hindsight was of no use. I mean, a lot of our audience come from the grassroots world, right? So a little kid misses an open goal and we say, next time, put it on frame. What we don't tell them is how to do it or what it could look like. So that extrapolates up at the highest levels of collegiate soccer too, right? Where we're talking at them, we're not really talking to them for sure. Um, we'll leave it with one last question. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Um, we've had 20 attendees and they've stayed with us the whole time. So that's always a good sign. Um, and this will go onto YouTube. And I've encouraged everybody in the chat box to send the idea of the mentoring program to at least one woman coach. So hopefully we can get 20 more potentials out of that. Um, I heard Julie Foudy tell a story one time that their trigger word with that particular era of women was ice. That every time there was a problem, that was their kind of, that was their bring everybody back. Do you want to share one you use at Columbus State or one um, physical tick or one word that you use that is a trigger for you guys? Uh, I, I think a lot of times it's just the word laugh uh, because, again, uh, it's a sport. We're supposed to be having fun. And, uh, you know, we say laugh a lot. Uh, we've also used a blade of grass. Mm -hmm. So if something goes bad, uh, I'll reach down, I'll pick up a, a little blade of grass and I'll just drop it and, and I'll say, hey, I'm done. I, I got to get on with it. Um, so little things like that. And yeah. uh, a lot of times the, the, the trigger words are individual uh, that make people kind of come back. Uh, around to say, hey, we, we've got to move on. Um, yep. I, I tell you, the one thing we, we do everything in our power not to use is the word lucky or unlucky. Um, we're, we're big fans at, at Columbus State of not using that. So when a kid misses a, a sitter from two yards out, uh, we're not saying the word, hey, you're unlucky. We try and fix it. We try and say, hey, lift your foot up. You, you hit underneath the ball. That's why it went over you missed a header from one yard because it went over. You headed, you got underneath the ball. You got to get up over it, head down. So again, you talked about solving it versus explaining the obvious. And uh, yeah, so we're yeah. real big on solving problems versus just stating the obvious. And I, I love the piece of grass. What I would say to some of our audience, though, don't go by Jay's book and copy all of Jay's because these have to be sustainable, right? They have to become a culture and ingrained and then when your freshmen come in it, the sophomores and the juniors and the seniors are perpetuating that whatever that culture is culture takes time to build and it's not something you just read in a book and try to impose overnight and then change it 20 minutes later so because i see that too much in the youth world that everybody's looking for the quick fix and we, we don't ingrain so um last one and we'll sign off with you what's next for the program when do you hope to see the athletes again in person uh, you know, it's crazy. I just uh, got an email from the uh, athletic director where the crazy part with Division Two, it's it's been awesome. They've actually extended something called voluntary workouts for all of our student athletes. So if, say, 15 of them want a voluntary workout with a soccer coach, they can come back on campus today. Uh, the hard part is, is a lot of our campuses are closed. Uh, so we're phasing them back in. I think most schools are letting uh, American football teams back on campus first for two weeks, seeing how that goes. And then um, we are hoping uh, by July 1, uh, any student athlete that's back on campus, they want workouts. We're going to be back on the soccer field. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not – I hope that we don't have to do these things where we play in front of no fans. I know – I think I was, I'm in Orlando right now. I think MLS just passed that this morning where – all the teams are coming down here to play. All the NBA teams are coming down here to play. I guess all the NWSL teams are going to Utah, uh, not playing in front of fans. I hope we can at least allow fans at the collegiate level. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, when you, when you get back with them, I hope um, they, they're excited to be back together. And I hope you all guys uh, stay safe and well. You've been really generous with your time. And it's always a great sign for both you and me and Vince if, if the audience is, is in, as interested in the conversation as we are. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll, put this, um, we'll put this up for everybody online. And then tomorrow morning we have uh, Dr. Quinn and Sam Snow talking about the National Youth License, which is uh, very uh, special and dear to all of our hearts. So again, Jay, thank you. And thank you to our audience. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Ian.
Cheers, brother.